How many of you enjoyed last Sunday morning? How many of you learned something new at least? Listen, and I'm going to kind of part sit and part stand if y'all don't mind. But uh, this is the thing. And Zach, do you mind if I share this? He's like, what are you going to share? <laughs> Listen, Zach came up to me. He said, you know, he said, Pastor, that was a, a, a great message. He said, me and my wife had just been discussing this week how people really don't know the true identity of Jesus. Am I saying that right? Pretty much along the right lines? And I say, wow, that is so cool. Because to me, that's confirmation of the Holy Spirit at work confirming the messages I'm bringing. Does that make sense? Friday night freaked me out. Y'all want to hear a freaky testimony. So we're praying here at Minion Prayer. Isn't that right, Toby? Friday night. And a guy I hadn't seen in forever, going through with some issues in his life, came back, thank God. I'm believing God's going to get a hold of his life. And he's praying. And he prays the scripture out of Isaiah 41 that's a part of my message that night. And I was like, brother, I said, that was so prophetic, such a confirmation. You have no idea. Amen? So I love that. I love that. I love that. Listen, people need to know who Jesus really is. Now, there's two kinds of Jesuses out there. There's the Jesus that's this romantic, Hollywood, blue-eyed, white-haired, Viking picture that people picture. And there's the Jesus of the Bible. Amen? There's the risen Savior, the Lamb of God, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, and I think having a biblical perspective of who we serve is super important. Amen? For one, it'll put the fear of God in you. Amen? How many of you know, America, we need the fear of God? Amen? <laughs> this way I'm not doing my own thing. You're not doing your own thing. We're all doing what? His thing. Amen? So today I want to continue to talk to you about the true identity of Jesus. Who is Jesus really? And the first thing I want to talk about is he is king. Everybody say king. 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 Now, how many of you know a king has to have what? Has to have ki a kingdom. Has to have subjects. Jesus is a king. I want to show you this from scripture. Last week I talked about Jesus is God, preexistent with God, and he is God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were created through him. And not anything that was made was made except by him. Through him, all things are held together and consist. Remember what physics, they call it the strong force. Amen? How many of you know that new Star Wars movie came out? You know, everybody's talking about the force. The strong force, it's Jesus holding the molecules and the atoms together. Today, I want to talk about Jesus as Messiah. Everyone say Messiah. Okay, and you're going to learn what that word really means. It's funny because you say Messiah to people and you ask for a definition and you hear all kinds of weird, off-the-wall things, and it's like we really don't even know what Jesus is. We know he's Savior. He is Savior. Someone say amen. amen. <clears throat> but what's it mean to be Messiah? Matthew chapter 16, verse 13. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the word of God. We thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit to speak through me and to these, your people, today. Father, I thank you, Lord God, that with you there are no limitations, Father. I thank you, Father, for your Holy Spirit to take this bread and break it and give it to each of us as we have need in our life, Father. Where there is doubt or unbelief or sin or anything else or disobedience, Lord, that you will bring it to our light and to our heart by your Spirit, Father. They can be repented of and turned from, Lord God. Lord, we desire to be lights, Father. We desire to be children of the Most High, bought by your blood and obedient to your name. In Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Matthew chapter 16, verse 13 through 17. So when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Who do men say that I am? Jesus says, the Son of Man am. Now, that's an interesting question because the answer he got was fascinating. Look at what they said. <clears throat> now, this all the disciples. They're all given their little answers. Remember, it's a group of them, okay? How many of you have been super, I mean, in Sunday school? How many of you know when you ask a question, you hear all different answers coming from all different sections of the table, am I right? So that's kind of what you have here. 
So they said, <clears throat> some say John the Baptist. So over here, one of the disciples said, Lord, somebody says you're John the Baptist. Well, what's fascinating about that is John the Baptist had what? He had died. He was beheaded. So obviously there were some people in the Jewish sect somewhere that believed in reincarnation. Some of them thought John the Baptist had come back from the dead and he was John the Baptist. Some said that he was what? Elijah. Well, that's a little better. Why? Because Elijah never what? Elijah never died. <clears throat> Remember, he was taken up in a fiery chariot into heaven. And he is coming back physically, by the way, before Jesus. How many of you know the Bible teaches that? Amen. Some say John the Baptist. Some say Elijah. Others say Jeremiah, one of the prophets. They really didn't have a clue who Jesus was, was did they? Now, this is all the disciples, and they're talking about all the things they've heard in the crowds in the community about who these people think Jesus might be. And Jesus said to them, and this is the crux of our life. He said to them, who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? You know, Jesus is asking you that. Who do you say that I am? You know, some people, they're like, well, he saved me at age 11, and I hadn't lived for God yet, but he's my Savior. For others, he's like, man, he's my everything. I live and breathe and move, and in him I have my being and my essence every day. And for some, it's like, oh, Jesus, you know, well, that's what they talk about in church on Sunday mornings. You know, that's something religious people do. Who do you think and who is Jesus to you? Now look at verse 16. I love this. Simon Peter. Good old Peter. Amen? amen. <laughs> Peter was either right on the mark or right amen. off the mark. Amen? He's like, he's either right on or right off. So Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Wow. So out of all the hubbub, here comes Peter. And Peter didn't say, Some say you are. This was coming from who? Coming from him. He's like, I know in my heart who you are. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Now if you keep reading in the story, Jesus then goes on to talk about how he needs to be crucified, and Peter steps in tries to change his mind. Next thing you know, Jesus is telling Satan to get behind him. So Peter, at this moment, was doing awesome, amen? And he says, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father is, who is in heaven. Listen, this is the thing, guys. Unless the Holy Spirit gets a hold of somebody's heart and gives them a supernatural understanding, that's what revelation means, a supernatural revealing, a supernatural unveiling, a supernatural understanding, of who Jesus really is, they're not just going to be confused, but they could end up being eternally lost. Amen? And only God the Father can give the revelation that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. You see, somebody can know that in their head and still end up in hell. Someone say amen. amen. How many of you know that the demons believe in God and they what? They knew that Jesus was the Son of God, am I right? We know who you are. Remember demon-possessed people? We know who you are. And he'd command them to keep silent and cast them out. Remember that? So listen, knowing in your head, no, you've got to know. It's got to be a revelation from God. Because if Jesus is Messiah, if he's the Son of the living God, and it's a revelation in your heart, it's going to transform your life forever. Forever changed. Amen? How many of you can imagine ever going back to the way you used to be before you knew Jesus? Amen? Can you imagine that? No. Why? Because your life is forever, if it's been a revelation, forever transformed. Amen? Now, this is the kicker here. There is, now, you may think this is silly, but there are people out there in even some mainline denominational churches that think that Christ is Jesus' last name. They have no idea what Christ even means. 
And then you have people in the world that thinks it's a curse word. Jesus Messiah. Isn't that amazing that the devil only takes that name which is holy and can save a soul and has turned it into something blasphemous if used in an incorrect, blasphemous-hearted way? Are you following me? You never hear somebody say, Oh, Buddha. Oh, Muhammad. It's always the name of God, the name of Jesus. Amen? Christ comes from the word in the Greek. It's Christos. And it's a Greek word meaning anointed. Everyone say anointed. And I want to talk about this concept of being anointed here today. It's equivalent of the word Mashiach in Hebrew. Those who come on, uh, to our Friday night service, we use the word Yeshua HaMashiach, or Jesus Messiah, Yeshua Messiah. Messiah in Hebrew literally means anointed. Okay? To be the Christ or Messiah is to be the anointed one of God. Now, what does that mean to be the anointed one of God? To be anointed is to have sacred oil poured on one's head because God has chosen a person for a special task. Was Jesus anointed for a special task? Wow, what task was he anointed for? You don't have to answer, but think about that. How many of you know more than one? How many of you know that the, his death at, the, uh, 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 at Calvary was just one task? There was the resurrection, there's the second coming, there's the eternal kingdom. I mean, it goes on and on and on, amen? Priests and kings were anointed, and occasionally prophets. Kings were anointed during their coronation rather than receiving a crown. Now, we're going to talk about the kings of Israel, okay? So it wasn't like they received this big, beautiful crown at their coronation. Oftentimes, they were anointed as king by a bottle of olive oil that had been consecrated and prayed over. Do you follow me? And I'm going to show that to you here in the scripture in a minute. Anointed one, or the Lord's anointed, was most often used to refer to a king. So the king of Israel, when they said he's the anointed one, in Hebrew, guess what it said? He's the Mashiach. He is the Messiah. He is the anointed king. Now, how many of you know, when we say Jesus is Messiah, we're not talking about anointed king over earthly kingdom. We're talking about anointed king over all the kingdoms. Everybody say all the kingdoms. All the kingdoms. First Samuel 10.1. Then Samuel took a flask of oil, poured it on his head, and kissed him. Now, to give you some background on this, this is Saul. Saul was the very first king of Israel. Okay, And as the very first king of Israel... Samuel was told by God, because Israel said, we don't want the judges to judge us anymore. We want a king so that we could be like other nations. <clears throat> and actually what they said is, we want a Moshiach. We want a human Messiah to be king. And so Samuel took a flask of what? Oil. Oil poured it on Saul's head, kissed him and said, is it not because the Lord has what? anointed you commander over his inheritance. Who's the commander over God's inheritance? Everybody say Jesus. Jesus is the commander over God's inheritance. What is God's inheritance? Everyone say I am. Every believer in the kingdom of God is part of the inheritance of God. Amen? That's why it's so important that we're out here ministering to people and sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? God is always wanting to grow his inheritance. Not through the stock market, but through our mouths bringing the good news of Jesus to other people. Amen? Because when you lead somebody to Jesus, you've just added another individual to God's inheritance, to God's kingdom. Amen? Now, check this out. This is where David, little David, had uh, uh, gone to the place where he'd been anointed future king, Saul was trying to track down David and trying to kill him. David was running for his life. And let's see what happened. Then the men of David said to David, This is the day of which the Lord said to you, Behold, I will deliver your enemy into your hand, that you may do to him as it seems good to you. And David arose and secretly cut off a corner of Saul's robe. So Saul and his men were searching for David, 
And they went into this cave. What they didn't know is David and his men were already in this cave. <laughs> and they went into this cave and saw sleeping and all of his men fell asleep. They didn't, did not even keep a guard. And so David creeps over there and cuts off a corner of his robe. Now it happened afterward that David's heart troubled him because he cut Saul's robe. Why would your heart trouble you for cutting somebody's clothing when that person is intent on killing you and taking your life, killing you dead, physically, violently dead? That's what King Saul intended to do to David, was to violently kill him dead. And David, all he did was creep over there while all the men were sleeping and cut off a little bit of his clothing. But it says here that his heart troubled him. You know what that means? He was convicted of God. Did your heart ever trouble you when you do something that you probably have no business doing? Amen. That's the Holy Spirit telling you, eh, you might not ought to have done that. Amen. And he said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my master. The Lord's what? Mashiach in the Hebrew. You can look it up. He says to do this to the Lord's anointed to do this to the Lord's Mashiach. So again, I'm showing you the context that this word used. Now, why is this important? Because, you know, all the time we're like, well, how did the Jewish people miss who Jesus really was? And I'm telling you, it's because they were looking for Mashiach. They were looking for a physical king. They thought when Jesus rode on the donkey that he was coming to be king over Jerusalem and king over Israel. And when that didn't transpire... Then they're like the next day, crucify him. Are you following me? He didn't meet the, up with their expectations. So here he says, God forbid that I should do this thing, that I should stretch out my hand against him, seeing that he is the anointed, the Mashiach of the Lord. So again, I want you to see the context that the word Messiah is used. It's the anointed God. What was Saul anointed to do? To lead the inheritance of God's people. I mean, to lead the inheritance of God, which was the nation of Israel, and to be king. Am I right or wrong? Now check this out. <clears throat> First Chronicles 17, 11 through 14. Now this is what I call a messianic prophecy. And this is a prophecy, and you know, nothing against commentaries, and some are good, but listen, don't let commentary, don't ever think commentary is God said. Amen? Uh, uh, you know how people, some people think if the Pope speaks it, it's as if God spoke it? People treat the commentaries like that sometimes, too. A lot of commentaries say that this is talking about Solomon, but I'm going to show you it's not talking about Solomon at all. It's talking about the Messiah, talking about Jesus. When your days are over and you go to be with your fathers, now this is Nathan the prophet, and he's prophesying over King David. He says, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, I being God. One of your own sons from your own ancestry line. One Jesus from the line of the seed of David, amen? And I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for me. Well, Solomon built a house, yeah. Do you think that's the kind of house that God's really interested in? Or do you think he maybe has another house in mind? And I will establish his throne, how long? Is Solomon's throne been established forever? No. Has Messiah's throne been established forever? Someone say amen. amen. So we're talking about Messiah. We're talking about Jesus. I love this. He is the one who will build a house for me. What house has Jesus built? Because of his death, burial, and resurrection, he's made a way to enlarge the inheritance of God from the nation of Israel to the nations of the world. So that now all people of all kindreds and all tongues Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be what? Shall be saved. Amen? And look at this. I will establish his throne forever. I will be his father and he will be my what? I will never take my love away from him as I took it away from your predecessor. How many of you know God took it away from Saul? Saul sinned against God. God is like, all right, that's all she wrote. I will set him over my house and my kingdom, how long? Forever. Again, how many of you realize this is talking about Jesus? Amen? His throne. Whose? Messiah's. 
My son's throne, he says, will be established how long? Forever. I'll tell you what, you want to witness to a Jewish person and share with them the whole gospel? All you have to do is share these three scriptures right here. 1 Chronicles 17, 11 through 14. And explain it to them. Great witnessing tool. Amen? Isn't that amazing? All the way in 1 Chronicles, we've got the whole plan of salvation laid out. The whole truth, the Messiah, his kingdom, his throne. He was going to be a descendant of uh, David. And his throne would be established forever. And he would be over God's house. He would be the ruler over God's house. I love that scripture. Now, we said that Messiah, Mashiach, Christ, Christos in Greek, means anointed one. We said that to be anointed, Messiah would be anointed as king. And there's a second part to that anointing, and that's deliver. Everyone say deliver. Now, how many of you know most of the Jewish people missed the fact that Jesus was deliver because they were looking for the king. They didn't realize deliverer had to come first. They were looking for king. Amen? Do you get that? People say, well, how could the Jewish people have missed it? They were looking for a king, a physical king to come establish his reign. And how many of you know Jesus will be that? But before he could ever become king, what they didn't realize, he had to deal with the worst thing Far more worse than being enslaved to Rome, which was being enslaved to sin and being enslaved to the flesh. Amen? So this is who Jesus really is, deliverer. Christ or Messiah is his title, signifying that Jesus was sent from God to be a king and deliverer. Everyone say deliverer. Deliver. Isaiah 61.1, and I love this. And again, this is quoted later on in Luke chapter 4, verse 18. And if you ever turn there and flip there, you'll see it. Jesus opened the scroll. He's in the synagogue. He begins to read from the scroll. And he's reading from Isaiah 61.1. And it's about himself. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Because the Lord has what? Anointed me. So here's that anointing. Here's that reason we call him Christ. That reason we call him Mashiach, that reason we call him Messiah, that reason he's called Christos. He has anointed me, not just to be king, but to what? To preach good tidings to the poor. How many of you know Jesus preached good news to the poor? He preached good news. What's the good news, guys? Good news, you can have eternal life if you believe in me. Remember Lazarus had died? He said, though he be dead, yet if he believe in me, he shall what? He shall live forever. Amen? It says to preach glad tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Wow. So part of the anointing of Messiah was to heal the brokenhearted. How many of you know Jesus didn't just do that during his earthly ministry, but that's been multiplied by billions over the last 2,000 years of people who have turned their heart to Jesus and he's healed their broken heart. How many of you have had broken hearts healed? Amen? unforgiveness in my life towards father and mother and neglect and all the things I went through growing up as a child. And to have God to be able to mend that and heal that. Amen? That was his Moshiach. That was his anointing. Amen? Some of you, maybe you were raised in awesome homes, but maybe you went through breakups or hard times or difficult times. Something that tore things out of your heart. Jesus is was and will always be able to mend and to heal those broken places. Amen? He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives. Liberty to the captives. The anointing of God is upon and is still upon Jesus and upon us, his people, to bring deliverance, liberty to the captive. How many of you know people can be free and still be captive? I know people who are in jail who are more free than people who are free. And we've got this scourge of drugs and sorcery, and it's just tearing up our nation. And there's a lot of other things, but that's the thing that's just been heavy on my heart, heavy on my heart. And it's just crushing people's lives, tearing up their families, tearing up their homes. And I want you to know that the anointing of God is upon Jesus to proclaim liberty to those who are captive. 
Did you know that the power of God outweighs the power of addiction? Someone say amen. Let me say that again. The power of the Holy Spirit of God outweighs the power of any addiction. Don't you be lied to by the devil. And don't let a neighbor or a friend or an acquaintance be lied to thinking that their addiction is stronger than the power of God to change and break that off their life. It's not. Someone say amen. amen. And how many of you know there are some terribly addictive, horrible things out there now? To proclaim liberty to the captives, the opening of the prison to those who are bound. Amen? Zechariah 12, 8 through 9. In that day, the Lord will defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. The one who is feeble among them in that day shall be like David. And the house of David shall be like God, like the angel of the Lord before them. In that day, Jesus is coming back to establish his kingdom. This is talking about the future war against Jerusalem. <clears throat> we talked about this before. How many of you know at the proclamation of Jerusalem as the capital of Israel? It's prophetic. I think it starts a prophetic timetable. One day the nations of the planet are going to be encamped around about Jerusalem to destroy it. And that's when God himself will defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Isn't that amazing? So yes, he is king, but he's also coming as deliverer. How many of you think if you were in the city of Jerusalem and you saw your city besieged by foreign armies that you'd be in need of a deliverer? Amen? <coughs> it shall be in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. Now, this is it, guys. I'm going to close with this. The New Testament revelation of Jesus is delivered. This is what the Jewish people, not all of them, but most of them missed. They were looking for Messiah the King. They were not looking for Messiah the Deliverer. And before you could ever have Messiah as King, you had to have first Messiah's Deliverer. Why? Because God loves the planet enough. God so loved the world that he didn't want the world to perish. He didn't want to just save Israel. He wanted to save all of mankind. Wow, it gives me chills, amen? All of mankind. That's the love of God, amen? And the only way he could do it is if the anointed one, the Mashiach, was anointed first as deliverer, then later as king. The New Testament reveals a much better deliverance provided by Jesus the Messiah, amen? Deliver Isaiah 61.1. And we already read that. A deliverance from the power and penalty of sin. Someone say amen. amen. How many of you are thankful for that? What's the penalty of sin? Death. death. But when we're talking about death, we're not talking about physical, your body dying. We're talking about eternal torment in the lake of fire. Now I can't even tell you, if hell... Man. You know, we don't talk about this much, but if hell gives up the dead in it for the great white throne judgment, and one day God takes all of those who were in hell, and literally they end up also in the lake of fire. That's a scary thing, isn't it? And you say, what's a lake of fire? I don't know. All I know is it can't be a good thing. The Bible calls it second death. Amen. And all I know is it says that the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. So when we're talking about deliverance from the power and penalty of sin, it should be glory to God and thank you, Jesus, that you saved me from eternal death. Amen? You see, that's why we need to know what we're saved from and who saved us. Because it's like, Wow, this is like jaw-dropping every day, on your knees, thank you, God. That's, the early church had an understanding of this, amen? In the church, it's like, oh, Jesus, yeah, that's Christmas stories, and, you know, Christmas time, and Easter, and this and that. And it's like, no, you talk about people who don't know the Lord. But they've got to see a passion in us, and we'll have a passion for God and a passion for Jesus if we understand what it is we've been delivered from. Romans 6, 23, For the wages of sin is what? Yeah. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Eternal life. Life forever. And not on this 
planet at this geographical location, amen? With new bodies. How many of us need new bodies, amen? <laughs> new bodies, glorified bodies, hallelujah, amen? No more fighting with the flesh, hallelujah. That's the gift of God. You didn't earn it. It's a gift. I can't think of a more glorious gift that I could ever receive in my life than the gift of God's eternal life. Eternal life. Amen? Do we get it? Acts 10, 36, 38. The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus the Messiah, that he is Lord of all, that word you know which was proclaimed throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God, what? Anointed Jesus of Nazareth with what? The Holy Spirit and with power. What has God anointed you and I with? The Holy Spirit and with power. Who went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And you know, Jesus, Jesus wasn't content with just reaching the people of his day. So what he did is when he ascended, he sent his spirit and multiplied himself out in millions of people. And those millions of people are called what? Disciples. And now our task is we've got that anointing. Wow. You've got the Mashiach? Yeah, he's the Mashiach. You've got the anointing, though, because where does he live? In you. And he's in you. And now he's anointing you with the Holy Spirit and with power. Isn't that the whole thing that Pentecost was about? But you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You shall be witnesses unto me, both in Judea and Jerusalem, unto the Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. Amen? Anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. Does God want you going about doing good? Does he want you going about through the name of Jesus, healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him? But thanks be to God, say this with me, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 57. Now I want to read it a different way for you. I want to read it how it would read in Greek or Hebrew. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus, who is Messiah, Deliverer, Savior, and King. Amen. He is Christ. He is King. He is Deliverer. He has delivered me. Amen. You want to share Jesus with somebody, tell them how he's delivered you. That's all they need to know, guys, is he's still the Deliverer. He's still the Anointed of God. Amen. You say, well, how does this help me? Well, A, it helps you understand the word Christ. When you say the name of Jesus, the name of Jesus Christ is powerful enough to command demons to come out of human beings. Powerful enough to see a lame man begin to walk and leap. Deaf ears to be unstopped and blind eyes to be opened. It's powerful enough to make you do things and go places you never dreamed or thought you could ever do. That's how powerful the name of Jesus Christ, Jesus Messiah, Jesus the King and Deliverer who delivered me as King of my life. Now let me tell you how he can deliver you and be King of your life. And how many of you know Jesus can't truly be Savior unless he's Lord, King over you? You're in his kingdom. If you're in your, his kingdom, he is what? King. And if he's King, he has to be in control. You've got to let go of the reins, let go of the reins of your life. Lord, what is your plan? What is your will? What do you want in my life? You open up your heart to say those things. God will begin to work in you in new ways and fantastic ways you couldn't imagine. Amen? Let's stand to our feet. I want us to say this one more time because I just love this. And how many of you know we do have victory? Amen? Amen. Victory over death, victory over the grave, victory over hell, victory over sin. Amen? Victory over the past. We have victory over Satan. Victory over demons. Victory over every facet of this life. But thanks together. 
But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we bless you, we love you, we thank you for the good word of God today, Father. Father, I pray, Lord God. Yes, 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 Lord. You know, even as I'm praying the Holy Spirit just now, speaking to me, that there are some here who have been wrestling with addiction. It could be a small addiction, big addiction. <clears throat> now, I'm not even going to call you forward today, but I'm going to ask you to be bold right where you're at. You don't have to say what it is to me, but I want you to lift your hands. You lift your hand, say to God what that addiction is, so he hears you. Nobody else needs to hear you. And I want to have your hands stay up. I want to pray that Jesus, the anointed deliverer, by the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit, deliver you today from that addiction. Keep those hands up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Keep them up. Father, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus, the Messiah, the anointed deliverer of God, by the power and by the anointing of your Holy Spirit, we pray for those who are wrestling with addictions in their life, be it small or big. And Father, we just bind that stronghold off of their life in the name of Jesus the Christ. Father, we command that stronghold to be broken, to be loosened off of their life, loosened off of their mind, loosened off of their heart, Father. We set it aside in the name of Jesus. And Father, I thank you that every thought be taken captive to the obedience that's in Jesus, the Messiah. Lord, we thank you that you have the power to overcome that addiction in our life. And you've given your Holy Spirit to empower us to live victorious through Jesus Christ. And Father, every day empower these to transform their minds by the word of God to get into your presence, Father. And we declare it's broken off of their life right now in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen.